So welcome today um, uh, at this uh, Walk Listen Cafe, where, as I said, the, a small crowd. So feel free uh, when you feel like it and have something um, useful to add to jump in and, and um, ask myself or uh, could have about his work or the things that uh, he uh, has, uh, is going to present to you. Um, with us, uh, Eugenio Ticelli, uh, uh, he is a, a computer scientist and independent researcher who is also the director of Ohovos, which is a web-based and mobile platform for the collaborative creation and management of community memories. Since 2011, Eugenio has worked with both urban and rural communities interested in presenting and representing their core challenges, making them, that is the challenges, known to other members of their communities, the public at large. It was a platform of people to share their views and document their environment. clips and sound recordings. Now, Eugenio is based in Mexico, um, where he also originally hails from, but he also has spent a lot of time in Spain, uh, while he has worked in communities and with communities in places as far apart as Tanzania, South Sudan, Colombia, as well as Mexico itself. Now, if you have uh, by any chance taken a look at Ojovos, uh, you might have seen that it has some functional similarities with platforms like Echoes, GuideMate, SoundTrails, Gesso, and others. But although Ojovos has been used as an artistic, artistic medium, the platform itself has more often been deployed in a more social cultural context. And I think that, that Eugenio is also going to talk a little bit more about that, uh, which is also something that I uh, very much appreciate because that's also more or less a little bit of my own background. So um, uh, I'll give the floor to Eugenio, who will expand a little bit on his work. And as I said, we're a small crowd. So if you have um, any questions or remarks, you are very welcome to jump in during the presentation, unless it's Eugenio. And also uh, afterwards, uh, be very well uh, pointed out to me that, and I can see that my connection is not very bad. So if I drop off, I'll be back as soon as possible, but you can, talk amongst yourselves, which I'm sure you're very capable of. So Eugenio, please go for it. Thank you very much, Babak. And thank you all for being here today. And thank, thanks for this lovely invitation. Uh, I, I, I must say that I got this invitation about two or three months ago. And I didn't know about the Walk, Listen, Create platform and network. So I was really thrilled to find this community, although I have not been very active because of work. You know, my day job sometimes does not allow me to, to enjoy the, the exploration of different projects and interesting people, but I'm expecting to do it quite soon. And uh, I'm, I'm, I have to say I'm, I'm really excited today because even if we're a small crowd, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we all share this love for mapping, this love for creating projects that maybe are a little bit difficult to classify there, perhaps between artistic projects, mapping projects, participatory projects with maybe a social angle or not. Maybe that's always something that has to and that can be debated. And well, today I want to present you a little bit about my work for not only the past 10 years, but the past almost 20 years. Uh, before this talk, uh, I, I had a, a brief chat with uh, Babak, and he uh, suggested to sort of present the artistic origins of, of this platform. So I prepared a talk that sort of goes, it's a story that goes from an artistic strategy to a transdisciplinary research, which involved environmental scientists, but also farmers, and finally led to a development project in Tanzania. And in the me, uh, as I talk to you about all these things and how I went from one thing to another, 
I will also present the, the Ojovos platform, which perhaps is, is not very interesting in the sense that Babak already said that this platform is actually quite similar to other platforms that already exist. I will try to explain why I sort of reinvented the wheel at some point. Uh, but in any case, I will briefly talk about the platform. Uh, maybe what is more interesting for you all is that it's an open source platform that you can try and use if you wish. And I will be very happy if somebody here wants to, to try it out. So, uh, and I also uh, uh, present my apologies. My English is not so good. Um, I haven't practiced my English lately very much, but I will try my best. And of course, at any point, if you want to intervene, if you want to comment, if you want to ask a question, just go ahead, uh, open your microphone, and I'll be very happy to talk to you. So I have a presentation. I will try to make it short and fun, uh, but it's actually a long story, so I'll try to make a long story short. But as I said, at any point, please uh, go ahead and ask questions, comments, whatever, whatever you want to know more about, just let me know and we'll talk. Okay, so let me just share my screen and I will start. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not too familiar with, the, with this platform. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so uh, as you know, the title of this talk is Mapping Community Memories. And community memories is the term that uh, together with a researcher called Luke Stills, I came up to sort of uh, put a name on what I was doing. You know, these kinds of things happen and you sometimes start doing things and you don't know exactly what you're doing, how to name it, how to classify it, how to, where do you put it? So community memories is this idea that a community gets together and uses some device or medium for recording their memories and uh, preserving not only things that happened in the past, but actually things that are happening and matters of concern, common interests, uh, views, opinions, etc., etc., etc. So all of these things can go into community memories. But the important thing is that communities themselves are the ones who, who create these, these memories. It's not somebody coming from the outside with a camera or with a recording device and sort of capturing what is going on in the community. It's more like the community itself is recording its own memory. So actually the story begins in 2003. Uh, I was living in Barcelona and I was collaborating uh, with an artist called Antonia Bad. He's a very well-known artist uh, in Catalonia at least. And I was, uh, as Babak said, I'm a, a computer scientist, so I was collaborating with Antonia Bad as a programmer. Uh, but we were also sharing ideas and many of the projects that we did together were actually shaped by the two of us. But one day uh, Antonia Bad came to me and he said, well, I just came back from Brazil and I met a group of guys in Sao Paulo who are motorcycle messengers. They call them moto boys. And you know, these guys, they are really vital for the city. They deliver documents, they deliver all sorts of things, but they have very bad press. Everybody's talking about them in a very bad way. They say that they are hijackers, they are criminals, they cause accidents, but actually they're just normal people trying to do their work and they're actually the victims at that time they were and i think they are still the victims of traffic accidents uh, at that time uh, around one motorboy per week was was dying because of these accidents happening on the streets 
So Anthony told me, I also discovered one thing which is quite interesting. He said, uh, I, I found this phone, and of course it was not a phone like this one. If you remember the kinds of phones that we had in 2003, they were mostly Nokia phones with a keyboard, and they were starting to have cameras, which was really new at that time. It was not common at all to have a phone with a camera. And also to have a phone that could connect to the internet, was, that was really a novelty. So Antoni told me, uh, why don't we connect these two things? Uh, why don't we create this sort of workshop in which we invite the Moto Boys? And the Moto Boys, we, we give them these phones, because the Moto Boys at that time, they didn't own a smartphone. So we sort of uh, give them the phones, and they can document their daily lives using the phones by taking pictures, audio recordings, or videos. So I said yes. <laughs> Uh, and I took up the challenge because at that time, technically, it was not entirely easy to, to sort of send content from the phone to, to a website. The idea was to create this, this shared space on the web where all the pictures and videos and audios from the Moto Boys could be gathered and then made uh, public, made, made known to the public. You know, this sounds so banal today, everybody's sending their, their pictures uh, to Instagram, whatever, and there are tons of software and platforms that do this. But just try to think, uh, go back to 2003, and this was ex absolutely not regular at all. It was not, not, not normal at all. So I started working on the project. Uh, at some point, I made it work, and I, I was like, hey, I made it. I mean, it was a technical challenge, but I was very happy. When I first sent a, a picture and it appeared on the web, it was like, wow, this is great. This is like magic. Uh, so the project started once the technical issues were solved. And actually, we did not begin with uh, the Moto Boys in Sao Paulo. Because of different things, the project did not happen. But the first project that we actually did together with this scheme was in Mexico City, uh, my hometown. And it was not with motor motorcycle messengers, but actually with taxi drivers. And if you remember, or maybe you don't, or you, you never knew about it, but if somebody came to Mexico City, the first thing that people told them was, do not take a taxi. You, it's very dangerous, you can get robbed, you can get hijacked. And Okay, it was a similar problem that the motor boys were facing. They, they were facing bad press, they were facing a bad public opinion. So we wanted to just have a group of taxi drivers and let them uh, speak for themselves using these tools and having this uh, website where they could collect their pictures and show them to the public. So I will show you some pictures of the, the projects starting in Mexico City. These are some of the pictures that the taxi drivers took in 2004. That's the time when the, the project took place. It was called City of Taxi or Taxi Site. And we had 17 taxi drivers, just one woman and most uh, 16 men, who accepted their invitation to join the project, to use these tools and to portray their daily lives. So, you know taxi drivers see many amazing things every day. This is a big, huge fire going on somewhere in the, in the city. This is a demonstration by taxi drivers in the main square of Mexico City in the Zócalo. And these are the, some of the, most of the taxi drivers that took part in the project. The project uh, lasted only for three months, but in those three months, a huge uh, pool of, of uh, pictures and, and stories was gathered. Around 5,000 pictures were gathered by, by these people. And our, our job was to sort of uh, provide this platform to sort of coordinate the group uh, together with the taxi drivers going around the city with the phones and taking pictures. We organized uh, weekly meetings for the taxi drivers to, to get together and discuss 
what they wanted to portray, how they wanted to portray it, and so on. So it was also uh, the, 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 um, the, the component, the, the, getting, uh, the component of getting together in, a, in the same room and discussing was also very important for, for this project. And what we also did was try to, to make it known, to make it known to the, to the public. So we, we made these this little newspapers, uh, even some taxis had the, the URL of the, of the project uh, drawn on, on the taxi itself. So it was also our job to sort of amplify these voices that, that the taxi drivers were, were trying to make heard. So we jump to the next project and you will see we go from one project to the next, but I will, I, I will not go very deeply into each of the projects. I will just say that they were all conceived as artistic strategies in which a group of people is invited to create the piece itself, and the piece itself is, as I said, a community memory. Uh, so after working with taxi drivers in Mexico City, we had the chance to work with uh, young uh, gypsy communities or Roma people. Uh, these Roma people were found in two different cities in Spain, in Lleida and León. And if you know how they are treated in Spain, they are discriminated, they are, uh, they also have this, this problem, uh, if, if we want to sort of draw a line between all the projects, we, we can say that these projects involve groups of people at risk of social exclusion. Taxi drivers were being labeled as criminals. Roma young people were also labeled as criminals, as lazy people, which of course is a lie. And what we also wanted is for these young people to have this chance to, to, to have this medium and make their voices heard. Also remember that this is before Facebook, this is before social networks. So those projects had that kind of relevance. We were providing a, a platform that did not exist at the time. Okay, so we worked in 2005 with uh, young Roma people in Lleida and León, two different parts of Spain. Then, in, also in 2005, we worked with a group of uh, prostitutes, which were also immigrants and transgender, and they worked on the streets. Uh, we also did a similar setup with the same kind of tools, inviting this group of people to express their views, their opinions. And uh, we did this project specifically together with a group, uh, a feminist group that dealt with this specific issue because, of course, we were not prepared to, to sort of uh, address the project in a proper way. So we had this, this tutorship from, from this group. Uh, it was very interesting to see what they wanted to portray about themselves and about their lives. Uh, this group of people, they just wanted to show the public that they were not bugs. That's actually the, kind, the, the word that they used. We want to show that we are not bugs, we are just regular people, we have normal lives, we, we like TV shows, we, we like uh, fancy clothes, etc., etc. So if you look at this project, which, by the way, they're all available online. You'll see very normal pictures, nothing scandalous, nothing too flashy or, or provocative. It's just normal people trying to show that they're normal. Uh, then at the end of 2005 and beginning of 2006, we did a project that also technically was quite different from, from the previous ones and also artistically. Because in the previous projects, we found a group of people, but we just moderated the meetings of the people where they decided what they wanted to portray. But in this project, which was called Barcelona Accessible in 2005-2006, we actually invited a group of people on wheelchairs to map the inaccessible places in Barcelona. So, for example, stairs, um, very uh, steep ramps, all kinds of obstacles that they found, they were supposed to 
portray them using the phones. This is the, the Nokia 6610, if I remember correctly. It was the, the one of the most advanced phones at that time. And also what is very interesting is that uh, these phones and, and practically all of the phones at the, at the time did not have a GPS module in, inside them. So, you know, the, the smartphones that we carry today, they have a GPS model inside them so we can find our coordinates and track ourselves on a map. But in 2005, the phones didn't have the GPS module, so you have separate GPS modules that communicated with the phone via Bluetooth. So these people on their wheelchairs had the phone on one hand and the Bluetooth, the GPS Bluetooth module on the other hand. And what they were doing is not just taking pictures of the inaccessible spots on the, in the city, but also mapping those spots and putting very literally those uh, spots on the map. So maybe you cannot see very well from this picture, but it's actually a map of Barcelona. And there are all these little colored dots. In the end, more than 2,000 obstacles were identified. And the, the different colors correspond to the different categories of obstacles. As I said, sidewalks, uh, steps, ramps, etc., etc. So it, this was a very interesting project because it was more oriented to, towards a goal. It was not open-ended. But we created, together with these people, I mean, these people, uh, on the participants created the map and we just printed it and delivered it even to the mayor of the city, which was quite interesting because it was like, hey, uh, the people who are suffering from these problems, they are pointing the problems directly. They're pointing them out directly. So here is the map, please do something. And it was quite interesting because we had some, a sort of dialogue of maps, uh, because some weeks later, the, the, the mayor, the, the city of Barcelona, uh, published the map of all the accessible places in the city. So they acknowledged that there was a problem, but they also said, well, yes, there is a problem, but we're doing something about it. So it's, it was a, a, a two-way communication, which was interesting. And I have to say that some of the problems that were pointed out, especially those in public buildings, were, were solved at some point. So uh, let me go on. Uh, after this project in Barcelona, we worked in 2006 with the Nicaraguan immigrants in Costa Rica. And if you know Spanish, maybe you can read uh, what these people are saying with these little comic style balloons. But what they're saying is, uh, this is a picture of an actual meeting of the participants of the project. And what they're saying is that uh, they only have two phones for the project. But every time they get together, they rotate the phones, uh, which means that if this person has the phone, they have a week to use it, and the next week they will pass on the phone to the next person. So that, in that sense, it, 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 it was not only to, to save resources, to, to spend less money on phones, which is important, of course, but it was also done to sort of redefine the phone itself from an individual device, which was designed to be an individual device, to a more communal uh, device for, for documentation and sharing uh, common, common interests, common goals. And here, if you know about the situation of Nicaraguan immigrants in Costa Rica, they're also discriminated, as are many immigrants throughout the world. So that's why we wanted to, to actually work with these people and allow them to show the Costa Ricans that they were just trying to live in their country as regular citizens, workers, regular persons. After Costa Rica, well, these are two pictures taken by, by the Nicaraguan immigrants in Costa Rica. They were working, they were uh, standing for their rights. After Costa Rica, we worked with motorboys, finally. In 2007, uh, four years after we sort of had this project in mind, 
we made it to Brazil, we made it to Sao Paulo. We found this group of motoboys and of course the motoboys were already prepared, they were already waiting for the project to happen, so when it started happening they were really excited about it. And they sort of, well, started going around the city in their daily lives, their daily jobs, but also portraying whatever they found. And they, as you can imagine, they found all sorts of things. Here's just a picture of the meeting uh, space. It's in the Centro Cultural de Sao Paulo, the Sao Paulo Cultural Center. And, uh, well, it was very interesting to have this cultural center with all the, the motorcycles and this table where the motorboys would sit and talk about the project and discuss what they wanted to portray and how. And these are the things that they portrayed, like protests of motorboys asking for better conditions, for better working conditions, facing police officers. Uh, as you can imagine, they had huge conflicts with, with police, uh, the police forces. Uh, accidents, of course, and this is a picture in which, unfortunately, there are uh, the people who got hurt did not get hurt very badly, but as you can imagine, they, there were even worse accidents where people actually lost their lives. But this is just one, just to give you a taste of what was portrayed by them and their daily lives, like fixing the motorcycle. So it's actually the community creating its own memory, creating its own view of the world with our with media that, okay, were sort of temporary, perhaps, or lent at, uh, in, in a way. But during that period of time where they had the chance to, to, to use the, the, the platform, they, they, they could sort of take advantage of it and show whatever they wanted to show. Uh, I'm almost finished with this first stage of the project, uh, but I want to talk in 2008, we did also a project with people in, uh, in wheelchair, on wheelchairs in Geneva, in Switzerland. And maybe you can think that uh, everything in Switzerland is quite perfect and polished and adapted for people who cannot uh, walk. But it was not the case. The people on wheelchairs in Geneva actually found a lot of obstacles. This is one drawing from one of those people. And it's the table, everyone getting together with their phones and discussing about the project. We also worked in Colombia with displaced and demobilized people because of the armed conflict. Uh, this was the first time in which we worked with two different groups in the same project. The displaced people, the people who had to leave their hometowns because of the violence, and the demobilized persons who are actually ex-guerrilla fighters who uh, wanted to stop, uh, actually had stopped uh, being part of the guerrilla and wanted to take up, uh, let's say, to lead normal lives. So this was a very, also very interesting project for us because at some point the two groups of people, they, they chose to, to meet together in the same space and to work together in the same project. Uh, of course, as, if you, as you can imagine, this is not an easy thing because these are two groups that are antagonistic. Uh, the displaced people had to leave their hometowns because of the guerrilla fighters. So meeting together was not an obvious thing, not an easy thing to do, but they, they themselves, they actually asked for us to, to facilitate this, this meeting. And the project went on, they worked together for a while, and they also created this community memory, even though uh, maybe you cannot uh, speak about the community here, probably it's two different communities, but sort of coming together for, for a common project. And finally, uh, the last project uh, in which I collaborated with Antonia Bad was in the Sahara Desert with the Sahrawi refugees living in southern Algeria. It's one of the forgotten conflicts of the world. Uh, very few people talk about this conflict, but since the end of the 70s, there is uh, around 
100,000 or 200,000 Sahrawi refugees living in camps in southern Algeria. And they're stuck, literally stuck there. Lately, a conflict, an armed conflict arose, which made matters worse. And, but when we went there, we were invited to, to, to do a project there in 2009 and 2010. We met, uh, we, uh, I must say that uh, Facebook was already becoming quite widespread. You could already find people, even in refugee camps, who had smartphones. So the technologies that we were bringing were not entirely novel. What was really lacking there was internet connection. Uh, so it was challenging to work there. This is one picture taken by one of the participants of the project in the Saharawi refugee camp. Uh, and as you can see, they portray the daily lives in the camps. We had the participation mostly of young women. And uh, these women decided to talk about specific things which did not directly deal with the, with the conflict. For example, they talked about uh, the, their, um, their traditions, the people who in some way or another were physically disabled, their memories about women, about nature, about children, about work. So you see things that do not directly deal with the conflict, but if you talk about children, where it's children growing up in a context of conflict, if you talk about women, it's also women trying to live in a very conflictive situation where there is they don't have the means to, to have a, a daily normal life. Uh, this is the only interconnection connection to the internet that we had at that time. It's a satellite connection, and this provided uh, connectivity at least to, to one of the camps. So it was technically a challenging project to do, but uh, it really opened my eyes to the potential that these sort of platforms could have in such environments in which you would never expect uh, people communicating using the internet to, to show, uh, to speak out, to make their voices heard. Now we, we find this. We, if you, I, I follow people on Twitter uh, who are tweeting from the Saharawi refugee camps, for example, or from other places uh, around the world which probably are not conventional in the sense that they are well connected, they're well equipped with uh, technological infrastructure. But now it's, it's something that's happening. Uh, only 10 years ago, it was still rare to have this. And I also must say that if you think about the history of the web, we've gone from a sort of utopia uh, in the last say, 20 years from indie media, which was this media platform that was activist, and they, they had this slogan that said, don't hate the media, become the media. So there was this sort of utopian view of the possibilities of the internet. At this time, the project, uh, when the project of the Sahrawi refugees was happening, it was just before the Arab Spring, where, as if you remember, um, Facebook and other uh, web platforms were used to organize protests and organize the activists and, and all, of, all of these things. So we're, we were still in this utopian time of the internet. But then came the revelations of Edward Snowden who revealed to the extent to which our data is being surveilled by not only corporations, but also by intelligence agencies and governments and so on and so forth. And the extreme growth of platforms such as Facebook and their very um, controversial uh, role in contemporary politics. So uh, in a sense, we have gone from utopia to dystopia. But at that time, at the time that we were doing these projects, we, we still had this utopian feeling about the possibilities of the internet to, to, 
to sort of help people to amplify their voices and, and make them heard and, and denounce injustices and, and, and uh, or only portray their lives in a just way and not in the way that media normally portrays uh, their lives. So I will, I will make a very short pause. Uh, and if anyone has a, a question or a comment, I'll be very happy to to start the talk because I still have some things to show to you, but uh, maybe this is the first uh, stage of the project in which things were still within artistic strategies. Most of the projects that you saw were uh, later shown as exhibitions or as books or as different uh, media that, that could be shared with the public. So if you have any comments or questions, I'll be very happy to hear. Leaving a comment, if uh, there is sorry, sorry there is Eugenio, for this first part, uh, uh, I fear that you are not hearing me. Is that correct? Yeah, I can hear you now. Ah, great. I'm going to turn off my video to improve the, uh, the hopefully the quality of my connection a little bit. Thanks a lot, Eugenia, for this first part. Uh, very um, rich. Um, which is very nice to see um, how um, you've deployed the technology that you make available in such broad um, uh, contexts in so many places. Uh, and <clears throat> you you hint at it uh, a few times. You hinted at it a few times in your presentation. Um, but what maybe uh, is useful to reiterate is that, particularly in these times, just being able to give a voice to um, people on the mar in the margins is uh, an, an extremely beneficial outcome for the people involved. They suddenly realize that they are being heard. Um, I wanted to point it out. And I also want to point out uh, this other thing. You also brought up that um, the uh, project that you did in um, uh, Saharawi. Saharawi? Saharawi, right? Yes, Saharawi. Um, it was just before the Arab Spring, and uh, you said it as well, uh, that at the time, with the rise of Ar the Arab Spring in uh, many of the Arab countries as well, as of course, around the same time, the Green Revolution in Iran, uh, is that we as society at the time still believed that platforms like Facebook and Twitter were going to redeem us from um, the, the corporate and um, societal control or authoritarian control that we were or felt that we were living under. And arguably this happened to quite an extent during the Arab Spring, although really only Tunisia successfully came out of this, but that's, that's another story. But now, indeed 10 years later, after Snowden and Cambridge Analytica and the 2016 elections in the United States where Trump became president as a consequence, many believe, due to um, the manipulative algorithms of Facebook. Uh, we have a completely different view now of um, how social media or these platforms that really are perfect for giving a voice to uh, the people are actually very much used to manipulate the people. So, <laughs> from, so it has completely on 180 degrees uh, as to uh, how giving a voice to people through technology can help them, but it actually has been also hurting us. So that's two things that I wanted to point out. Uh, and as you said, uh, if anyone um, has a question, uh, David is asking, uh, uh, you might come to this a little bit later, but it's up to you. Uh, he's asking whether you can say something about the platform itself, although I think you so far have really talked about what came before Ochovos, because Ochovos really started at uh, about a decade ago. Um, so that I think is going to maybe be more the second part of what you would like to talk about, but it's up to you. Yes. Well, thank you, uh, Babak. Um, regarding your first comment, I think uh, when I say that we go from from uh, from you maybe exaggerating things and, and putting them as a black and white uh, view. And of course, we now we know things that we did not know about uh, social networks. And we know that they are also used to, to manipulate people, to, to sort of hook people into 
platform that uses an algorithm that is quite addictive and, and we're, I mean, social network addiction, uh, addiction is, is a thing now. And you see many people uh, trying to fight this addiction. But at the same time, I still think that these kinds of platforms can be very useful for specific groups that want to make their voices heard or, or simply want to exchange ideas, information, views, stories. I think they're still useful, but we have to be more careful than we were before. We have to, to sort of acknowledge that the, the, the scenario has changed. And I, I actually want to say something uh, about the platform uh, regarding uh, David's uh, question. And uh, thank you, David, for, for your question. In this first part of the, the projects that I just showed you, uh, we, as I said, we were using these Nokia phones that had this Symbian operating system. And please excuse me if I'm, I'm talking about very technical things. Uh, I'm a computer nerd. <laughs> so um, I, if, if uh, it sounds a little bit boring or abstract, please, please bear with me. But we created a very simple software tool for the Symbian operating system that just made it easier for people to take pictures, record audio and, and video, and send it to, uh, to, to the website of the project, right? Now, I, I have to be very self-critical with this first part of the projects that I showed you because of two things. First thing is that we did not engage deeply enough with each community. Some of the projects just lasted for three months the Moto Voice project, for example, it lasted for four years, even without our intervention. The Moto Boys were still pushing the project forward by themselves. But m many other projects were did, just happened for a very limited time and they were just finished. And sometimes the communities felt that they wanted to continue with the project. But when we sort of went away, we had to take the phones away, which is absolutely not uh, a nice thing and not a very responsible thing to do. So that's one of the self-criticisms that I want to share with you. It's one of the lessons, the hard lessons that, that I've learned. And the other one is that the platform that we were using in this project that, uh, that I just showed you was not open source. And that was, uh, I have to say, uh, I don't want to sound like I'm washing my hands, but that was not my decision. It was my colleague's decision to, to not release the platform as open source. And that's one of the reasons why we sort of split up. And uh, I wanted to actually create a platform, a similar platform to the one that we had used, but make it open source. That is, make it available to anyone who wanted to use it. And not just the software tools, the, the mobile application and the web application, but also the methodology. And that's also part of the next steps that I took. So um, I see also a comment from Mary Hooper here in the chat. Uh, maybe you want to share with us, Mary? Yeah, um, I've been doing a, hold on, I go into another room because there's some sound going on in a minute. Yeah, I've been doing an oral history project now for about six years, just on and off, very gently with uh, uh, Hastings fishermen who are one of the last beach launched fishing crews. Can't see me. I'm sorry, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, uh, and their inshore fishing is threatened because of um, EU rules on fishing, marine conservation, all kinds of things. They are a very sustainable 200-year-old uh, family intergenerational fishing fleet, much reduced. So I've been doing very gently for a number of years an oral history because 
some of the older fishermen are obviously getting a lot older. It takes a long time, as I'm sure you know from what you've been saying, to win the confidence and trust of people. Luckily, it's local for me, and I do it as and when uh, they're comfortable and available and myself. So we've now got a university interested in archiving all of that. But I've just recently been doing sort of conversations, I don't call them interviews, with um, also a man who was homeless for two years. And I said I would edit the conversation and give it to him to keep. Well, he's not homeless anymore, but, and he only has a mobile phone. But people don't now have CD players, obviously tape machines, this is very old tech. Um, they f have smartphones, but, but linking into things like SoundCloud and things like that, or even downloading an MP3 and playing it back on their phones, it's, um, so whilst this is a fabulous way of archiving and sharing, this kind of uh, community memory and Im important kind of social history. Um, the digital thing is also working against us because whilst people have the technology, they are excluded in, in a sense from uh, knowing how to access that kind of thing. And obviously we'll facilitate that, but that is actually quite a big, a big thing, I think. And I, and I was surprised, surprised myself, I didn't think it through. So that, that was really just my comment. And so maybe um, creating a, a platform like you were talking about that is very, very easily accessible, you know, where you can have their, unless if they want to release it, that's fine, but maybe their social history is private except for a national archive, or it's shared within a collection of things. Yeah, so it, it was really an observation. I hope, I hope that contributes. Thank you very much. It, it does contribute a lot because you, you raise very important points that it takes time to, to build trust with the community. And that's also one thing that I was missing in the projects that I just showed you because those projects were done really quickly. So we didn't have enough time to, to actually reach like deeper levels of meaning and uh, allow people to develop more what they wanted to say. It was just a very immediate thing. Yeah, that's uh, a luxury of time. Um, and in a way, you, you know, because people are always very uncomfortable to begin with. But then when you go away and they say, oh, but I, oh, I've thought of this. And, thought, and in a way, it kind of needs somebody within that group to then be, or several people to be able to then, as you were doing, facilitate that and start recording their own things and then somebody to edit and archive and kind of curate it, maybe not to exclude stuff, but maybe present something that uh, other people can digest. Yeah. No, it's, I think it's very important what you say, and, and you really need to find what is the right methodology to use with your community and what is the right sort of medium, as you said, uh, when even MP3s that can be exchanged on, on phones. Uh, funnily enough, or, or interestingly enough, when we worked in the Sahara, people exchanged music uh, in their, on their phones as MP3s and sending them, sending the, the sound files as through Bluetooth. So, so it was, I mean, people always find a way to, to do these things. They, they, and, and even if it's very simple, a very simple medium, if it works, then that's fine. You, we don't have to use very sophisticated platforms, actually. I'm, I'm against uh, extreme sophistication. Uh, there is maybe another uh, comment. Uh, maybe if, uh, if, you, um, if you allow me to just go on for a little while and, and show you the, the second part of the, of the talk. And then we can have a, a longer discussion because there are still some things that I want to show to you. So uh, I will share my screen again. Mm, okay, here we go. 
Okay, so as I said, this was the last project I did as part of the Megaphone project. It's uh, megaphone.net. I will, I will send you the link uh, on the chat. And then we split up, my, my colleague and I. So I encountered the opportunity to, uh, to start to, to begin a project in Tanzania. Now, I have to say what is the context of this project, because I think it's interesting. I was uh, starting my PhD, as, as I told you, I'm a computer scientist, but I, so, I also have a background in digital arts, in media arts. And I was doing a PhD in, uh, in which I also combined media arts with uh, environmental sciences. So I was in contact with uh, environmental researchers in, in a university in Switzerland that were studying uh, climate change. And they were trying to build high resolution models of climate change. Now, what does this mean? When we hear that the global temperature might rise 1.5 or 2 or 2.5 degrees, depending on what we do today, that of course is a global mean temperature. But what is actually going to happen in, in different countries or different areas specifically? And that's exactly what the scientists uh, wanted to find out at that time. And there was this project of collaboration between the Swiss University and the University in Dar es Salaam, the capital of Tanzania, in which scientists were trying to study what would be the effects of climate change specifically in Tanzania. And so this is Tanzania. Uh, it's in the Indian Ocean. It's a beautiful country. It's also a country that is very, very exposed to, to climate change. And at the time that the project began in 2011, uh, the people there were experiencing droughts, uh, very extended dry seasons, the rainy seasons happen twice a year normally. Uh, a long rain season between March and June and a short rain season in September and October. And in 2011, the short rain season had disappeared and the long rain season had become quite unpredictable. So farmers were the first ones to notice this and also to suffer the, the consequences of what was going on. Now, I also have to say, in Tanzania, around 80% of the population are farmers or in some way directly or in indirectly related to farming. So, of course, it was a very important matter in this country, but also for, for all of us, because we all depend on farmers, basically. But Tanzania was, was the country where we wanted to work. So we wanted to study not just what was happening to the farmers in terms of drought or unpredictable rains, but also other kinds of effects that cannot be predicted by climate models, such as this. This is a, a cassava plant. Cassava is one of the staple foods in Tanzania. And this is a plant that is attacked by a mosaic uh, disease which is caused by a virus, and this virus is uh, carried by this little white fly. So the white fly, when, when, when it uh, feeds, uh, when it arrives on the plant, the, the fly itself is not harmful for the plant, but the fly carries the mosaic virus, which actually kills the plant and makes it, uh, well, not fit for, for human consumption. Now, what does this have to do with climate change? Well, the white fly can reproduce more in dry weather. So if there is an increased drought, there is an expected increase in the reproduction of the white fly and therefore also an expected increase of the incidence of the mosaic virus disease. So these were the kinds of things, the non-linear things, the non-immediate, non-obvious things that we wanted to, to find out, to see. And the real experts here were the farmers, who were the ones who would point out at problems, at things that were happening on the ground, and maybe even also to solutions. So we came in contact 
with a group of farmers living in the coastal region of Tanzania in a very lovely town called Bagamoyo and around the town these farmers they had their lands and they were having their crops. She is one of my colleagues, Dr. Flora Ismail from the University of Dar es Salaam. She's a botanist. And this is my other colleague, a longtime collaborator, Angelika Hilbeck from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. She, she's an agroecologist and an entomologist. And that's me explaining the project to the farmers. So as you can see, it's a collaboration between scientists and myself coming from media art, coming from these projects that happen as artistic strategies, uh, as I already showed you, but in now trying to adapt the same tools for scientific research, but also for farmers to, to, to contribute to this research as re researchers themselves. So at that time, the farmers uh, had only heard about the internet. So as, as Mary was pointing out uh, in her own project, there is a big deal of, let's say, education that is involved in the sense that the farmers sort of have a very vague idea of what was the internet. So we actually went on the internet, look at, at it, explained what, how it worked, uh, what was in the internet, what were also the risks of the internet. But farmers were very, very much familiar with mobile phones. Uh, at that time, they did not have smartphones. Now they do. But at that time, they didn't have smartphones. But sometimes the farmers would say, I have two, two regular phones. Each one of them is, has a SIM card of a different company, so I can take advantage of the different uh, offers that each company has. So mobile phones were used quite intensively. So, the farmers were interested in the project. It sounded interesting for them, so they accepted to the, the, our invitation to participate. And we decided to name the project Saute Yawakulima, which in Swahili means the voice of the farmers. Um, at this time, I also started developing the, the tool called Ojovos, which was as I said, an open source tool based on the previous tools that we had used in, in the past for the Megafauna project, but now adapted to the new smartphones. When we arrived in Tanzania, we were starting to use uh, the Samsung phones, which were the cheaper ones. They had Android operating systems and they were starting to be uh, available in Tanzania. So this is the URL of the project. Maybe later, if you want, I can show you the, uh, the website and we can browse through it. But uh, maybe I, I, I would prefer to, to go on with, with, the, with the talk. And after a few weeks of starting the project, a very interesting thing started to happen. The farmers started interviewing themselves and they started asking questions to each other, like, how do you cope with extreme dry weather, which is the best crop to grow? Or why are you growing maize together with watermelon? And the farmers would say, well, the watermelon has very large leaves, and these leaves are very close to the ground. So the leaves actually help the, uh, to keep the humidity, the moisture of the ground, and this helps the maize plant. So this is an interaction between two crops. These are things that the farmers were starting to discover in their own fields. And these are the things that the farmers started portraying using the, the phones and the shared website. So I say that this is a very interesting thing because farmers discovered that this tool could be used to share knowledge with other people, with other farmers and to ask questions. But also when, when, they, asked, when they asked the questions and they did the interviews, and the interviews could be seen on the website, they had a computer, they have a group computer, and they took the computer to different exhibitions, to different places, and they showed other people what they had collected in terms of knowledge from, from other farmers. Uh, there was a map associated to, to this project in the sense that uh, Ojovos uh, allows you to, to map your pictures and your sounds. 
But I have to say, in this case, the map was not so useful for the farmers. It allowed us to locate what was going on, where, where it was going on, the stories, to situate the stories. But the farmers did not find the map so useful. What was useful for them are these words that could be used to classify each picture. For example, you can see knowledge and maze. If you use the combination of these two words, and now I will show you very briefly how you can do that, you can easily browse through the website. And if you, for example, are looking for knowledge about maze, you choose these two words, and then all the pictures related to, to these kinds of, of tags will show up. Uh, these tags, I have to say, were chosen by the farmers, so they classified also their pictures by themselves. So just to briefly uh, have a look at Ojobos itself, this is a screenshot of the mobile application. And it's, um, this is the English version. I have a Swahili version, there's also a Spanish version, and uh, it's quite easy to adapt the tool to different languages. Um, it's a very simple tool, and it's simple because it was designed with people who were not experts uh, on mobile phones and smartphones. Uh, they were not expert users. They could probably become expert users if they wanted to, but at that time we wanted people who were not expert users to be able to use a tool which was friendly enough for them. It has large buttons. And there is a reason for this, because farmers have large hands. And if you just have tiny buttons, it, it will be very difficult for them to, to just push the, the, to touch the right button. So what do you do with Ojobos? You take a picture. That's very simple. You just take a picture. You aim your camera and take a picture. Then you can record your voice and do that as many times as you wish. And the format that we use here is picture and voice. We don't use video for two reasons. First is technical, and the bandwidth that you need to transmit video is quite high, quite considerable. So if you create this combination of picture and sound recording, the bandwidth that you need for connectivity is less. But also, if you think about video, Maybe you want to uh, show a very complex thing and then the video lasts for five minutes and very difficult to make sense of the video or maybe the video is talking about different things that have nothing to do with each other or maybe somebody interrupts. So video is also a different media and of course it's very useful and it's very rich. But now in this project, we wanted people to focus more on specific issues. So that's why the second reason we are not using video. Here is a button in which you can add a tag from a list, a predefined list of tags. These are tags are agreed with the group of people that are going to use the tool. Uh, for example, as I showed you, knowledge, maize, the names of the crops, cassava, oranges, etc., etc and other tags, whatever tags that the farmers or anybody wants to use. And if you don't have the tag uh, in the list, the tag that you want to use, you can add it by hand just by typing it, which was a little bit more challenging for the farmers, but eventually they, they, they managed to do it. Then you save the picture, the voice recording, the tag, and the location, which is obtained automatically using the GPS on the phone. After you save that message, you have a list of messages that you have saved before, and you can send them or you can delete them whenever you want. It was done in this way because, as you can imagine, in most of the farms where farmers are working, there is no connectivity. So they could take the pictures even if they were not connected to the Internet, but whenever they went to the village, or somewhere where they could find connectivity, they could send all the pictures that they have saved previously. So that's also one of the constraints of the design of the, of the platform. And so that's it. It's a very simple platform. As I said, it's an open source platform. You can use it yourself, and then we can maybe go deeper into it if you're interested. 
But I'll just go on, just to finish uh, and say that the, the project in Tanzania went on from 2011 until 2016. Uh, the farmers really found it meaningful in the sense that they could exchange knowledge with other farmers. It was a platform for the mutual exchange of knowledge. It, this sort of um, enthusiasm for sharing knowledge, for teaching other people and from learning other people has very much to do with cultural uh, values in Tanzania. I, I can go deeper into that, but it would be too long. But just to say that sharing knowledge is a very important and very valued thing in Tanzania. And the project itself became sort of a, an identity for the farmers who were involved. This is a field where they um, were testing different varieties of cassava. And here it says, this is an experimental testing station of cassava. And this belongs to the group Sauti Yawakulima, which is the name of the project. So the group named itself after the project. This is just to show you that the, the project became sort of an identity for the farmers. And just to finish, as I said at the very beginning, this is a story that went from artistic strategies to this project, which is a transdisciplinary research project done together with scientists. And finally, what happened after 2016 is that a group of NGOs that were working in, in Tanzania local NGOs and international NGOs knew about the project and they found it quite interesting. And what these NGOs were doing were uh, training farmers on agroecological techniques, like using organic fertilizers, using organic pesticides, different techniques for intercropping and other uh, agroecological techniques. So they wanted to use this tool as a tool or backstopping. This is a term that probably you're not familiar with, but backstopping is basically providing assistance to the people that are being trained. So they wanted the farmers to use the tool to, to if they have a problem, they could send a picture about the problem and they would be contacted by a staff that would assist them with, with that particular problem. But also farmers who wanted to show their success in using organic pesticides and getting rid of, of different pests. So after 2016, the project was delivered and expanded uh, to, to this, uh, by these NGOs. It was delivered to the NGOs and they, they made it grow. Today, the project uh, involves around 6,000 farmers around different regions in Tanzania. And as you can see, I'm not in Tanzania, so the project is already entirely happening by, not by, it, by itself, uh, when I say by itself is uh, what I really mean to say is that it's happening without me, but with many people who are, uh, who are developing it. So these are some pictures. This is uh, one of the person of the NGOs. This is one of the trainers that is training the farmers on how to use the phones. And that's it. Uh, it sort of became something else. It uh, uh, escaped from let's say from my uh, intentions, which were on one hand artistic, but also uh, research intentions. And now it's being used uh, by Tanzanians for their own uh, development. I can also stop here because there are more things to share with you, but perhaps we can now have a second round of discussion. Uh, I think that would be so a good idea. I'll just Yes, extremely so, um, rich uh, overview. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I, I'm happy to hear from you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, no, my connection is also really bad. So maybe you're not really hearing me very well, right? There's also that. Chat, um, specifically, David asked two questions, yes, um, we, which we... is about to. I, I lost you for a while, sorry. Um, let me point you to David.
sorry. I, I, um, yeah, no, it's my connection. Here. I'm very sorry. Um, there, David asks two questions in the chat, and so does Mary. Um, maybe you can look at the chat and just answer the questions from the chat instead of me repeating. Sure, sure. So let me go uh, first with David's question. Uh, do you need your own server to use Ojovos? Uh, technically, yes. If you want to use Ojovos, you need to have your own server. But what I normally do is when somebody is interested in using Ojovos, I normally lend some space that I have on my own server for people to try out the project before they, they, they set it out like a full-fledged project. So I have these sort of testing grounds on my server where you can try it out for yourself and see if it really works for you. And then if you decide that it, you, you want to go ahead and, and use it, then you need your own server, but I'm quite happy to provide assistance for installing the software on your own server. Um, I have to also say that I have not maintained the software for the last two years and probably one in, in the in the computer uh, the informatics world that's a big sin not maintaining your software but it still works and i have to say this because i, I did a project last year with a friend in colombia and it works as it is but it needs to be updated depending on the kind of server that you use so just to summarize if you want to use it, uh, you can, I can, we can talk and I can create a space where you can try it out. And then if you decide to use it for yourself, then I, I can provide assistance to in, for installing the, the web application on your own server. I hope it answers your question. Okay, should I go to the next question? Uh, okay, uh, so Mary responds to, to Simon's comment. Mary asks, does anyone monitor content? Yes, yes, and that's a very important thing. Of course, there are many aspects that I didn't talk about because there is not enough time, but monitoring content is done by the group itself. So the group itself decides what things should be portrayed. So it's like a previous decision to say, okay, we, we want to take pictures about the effects of climate change. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. But then after pictures were taken, of course, you, you could all, all, always have people who were portraying other things and it happened. So the group decides whether to be tolerant with, with different other topics that deviate from the main topic, or if they actually want to delete the, the, the content that is not acceptable by the community. I'll give you two examples. First, uh, at some point, I was looking at the website and seeing what the farmers were posting. And at some point, there was this picture of a man with bruises in his body, like a black eye and, and really suffering. And I was shocked because it was, it was a very shocking picture. And so I asked the farmers, what is this? And they said, well, it's somebody who was stealing coconuts. So we don't have police that would arrest him. So we just beat him. And we took a picture of him to show everybody that you should not steal coconuts from us. So we had a discussion like, do you really want to show this on your website? Do you really have to have, want to have this content of, of a man that you beat? Uh, this is what you want to show other people. So there was a discussion, a very long discussion, and in the end, uh, they decided to delete this, this picture. Okay, but this was, this is always a process in which the community itself is involved. Of course, if the community is very large, these discussions are very difficult to have, so you have to delegate the monitoring to, to a specific person, right? And the other example I wanted to, to share with you is uh, in, I 
I worked in a, on a similar project in Mexico, and the farmers there, they, they were interested and, and we did the project, but the first thing they told me is that they didn't want to have maps because there were very, uh, very uh, delicate issues regarding land uh, tenants, the property of land. So a picture in a specific spot could get them into trouble. So this was like a preemptive monitoring or let's say like a preemptive condition that they say we don't want maps, right? So we did the project only with pictures and sounds, but no maps because the community said we, we, if we have maps, we'll get into trouble. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so there, let me go to the next question uh, by David. What platform system are contributions uploaded to publish and share? Is that a central one or specific to each project? Yes, this is a very good question because each project happens uh, in its own space within the same server. What I mean is on the, in the same server, on the same web server, you can have several projects and each one has its own associated database, its own associated URL. Uh, you, you can also mix projects, but I don't think that's, well, that would be an interesting experiment to do actually, but every project has its its own database and its own uh, web space. Uh, if if you want to to comment on, on on my replies, please please do. Otherwise, I just go ahead with with the with the questions here. Uh, then okay, Fiona said goodbye. Uh, Simon says, this looks very really simple, but if you've ever done any community engagement, you know how long it usually takes and how you have to put people on the ground to get the trust of the target group and then sell them on it, etc. This looks like there would have been a lot of, uh, sorry, a lot of that kind of work behind the scenes, hours and hours turning up at the community meetings, etc. Yes, definitely. I mean, what you see are the final results and I spent days, weeks, months with the farmers um, and the fact that the project lasted for five years, the project with the farmers in Tanzania before the NGOs came in, was because the farmers themselves saw that the project was useful for them. They found something that was useful, significant, important, and then that's when they took the project in their own hands. They, they claimed ownership of the project. But before they, that happened, it was really spending many, many weeks together with the farmers, which I have to say were quite enjoyable. I learned a lot from them and I still do, but yes, there is a lot of work behind the scenes. Uh, a question from Kaska Hempel, is the app available from the Play Store? Uh, uh, no, it's not available from the Play Store and there's a, a reason for this. Uh, as you saw, the, the projects are very specific for very specific groups of people. So it's not like uh, regular social networks that are open for everybody to participate. These are applications that are aimed at very specific groups. So this is one way to sort of control who can get into a project and who can't. And the other reason is that I'm not very happy with uh, Google. I try to avoid Google as much as I can, although we are all trapped in Google space and Facebook space and whatever. But if I can, I, I avoid uh, Google as much as possible. Uh, Let me add on to this, if my connection allows me, that that also means, I believe, that the uh, mobile uh, platform is only available on Android, not via the App Store, but only on Android and not on Apple, right? Exactly. Uh, I chose Android because that's, that was 
the platform that was growing in Africa. It's very rare to find iPhones in, in Africa. You can find them, but they're very rare. And the kinds of smartphones that the farmers can buy are all of, all of them, they are Android phones. Uh, if, uh, as I said, the, the code for Ojovos is open source. Anyone who is interested can look at the code. And if anyone really wants to, to build from that code and adapt it for the iPhone, that would be a great thing. But I haven't done it. Uh, so it's available only for Android. Uh, there's a next question from Lucy. She said, is there a time limit on the recording? This question is connected to the question from Mary, for example, regarding curation. Without audio editing, do you end up with long rambling recordings? Uh, yes, that is a problem because there is no time limit for, for the recording. Uh, the only limit would be the memory of your phone and the application checks if it's running out of memory, then it stops the recording. But if you have enough memory, then re the recording can go on and on. And there are, if you can imagine the interviews done by the farmers, there are very long, long, long interviews. Uh, I, I take the opportunity just to show you this little book. It's a book uh, about the project in Tanzania. Uh, it was curated, let's say, together with the farmers. Uh, the farmers and myself, we chose together the pictures that were going into the book, and it's 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 also a, another media for the community memory that was created by the farmers. But let me just show you. Here's a, a nice picture of a woman selling vegetables with her son, with her daughter, and here you can see the transcription of her interview below the picture, and it's a rather long interview. It goes on. So it's, as you can see, it's a long recording, uh, which is a challenge if you have to transcribe them, but then you also give the chance uh, for people to, to just speak out. Um, okay, I think there are, there's another question from Simon. He says, this was a, a real long-term project, then many projects are too short-term for this kind of impressive intervention, I think. Thank you, uh, Simon. Uh, yes, it, it took me, uh, well, not me, but my involvement with Tanzanian farmers went from 2011 until now, I have to say, but what I just showed you was between 2011 and 2016. It was quite challenging to actually find the funding to do it, to, for me to, to, to go back to Tanzania and stay there and sustain myself. So there are many constraints, many, a lot of material constraints for, for that actually shape projects into short-term units. But I just tried to make it as, uh, as, as a long-term initiative as, as long as possible. Also because, as I said, I, I enjoyed a lot the company of the farmers. I, I learned a lot from them. So I just did whatever I could to, to, to just keep on working with, with the farmers. Uh, and yeah, and then there's another one by David. Um, it would be great to run a project using off robots. Great but I don't want to run a server. Yes, um, I, you're right. I, I agree with you. I mean, it, it does uh, ask for a certain level of, of technical, uh, let's say, abilities. And I'm very much aware that not everybody is willing to install the, uh, the software on their own server. That's why I try to do this as a, let's say, a, careful operation in which if there is somebody who wants to use these tools, I try to provide as much assistance as possible. Okay, so first uh, allowing people to use my server as a testing ground and then helping people to make the jump to their own server, which is not an easy task, I know. And 
but it has worked in the past, and if you really want to do it, I mean, as Babak was saying at the very beginning, there are other tools that you can also use which are more simple. Uh, this is just yet another tool, and but if you want to use it, I'll be more than happy to, to provide assistance. Uh, how tricky is it to run the server, asks uh, Lucy. Once the software is installed, it's pretty easy. The tricky thing is actually getting the software installed, and it's not so tricky. Uh, I have experience doing it, and I can do it in 30 minutes because I already know how to do it. But uh, other programmers who have installed it on their own server took them like one or two hours, maybe. And after that, there is practically no maintenance that you need to do. Let me jump in there for a second. Uh, again, if my connection is good enough. <laughs> um, the, the thing with running your own server uh, is really that you know, when everything runs fine, you don't have to do anything. Uh, it's only when something goes wrong that you have to jump in. Um, and then it can be easier, it can be harder depending on, and if you are able to revert back to someone who knows uh, how servers work, then yeah, that's really what you probably at some point will need. But there is a deeper um, trade-off that uh, you have to consider with this. Indeed, I mentioned at the begin beginning that there are other similar tools out there, um, but uh, the big difference between those and this one is that with those, you are, if you are going to use them, stuck with their platform. Uh, there is uh, no control that you can exert uh, over these platforms and how they are available. Um, and you cannot uh, make a copy and make that your own. Uh, if you use uh, uh, Echoes, for example, uh, uh, it was mentioned, I think, by someone else. Oh, no, that was in an early, sorry. So if you take Echoes or, or SoundTrails or Gesso or um, any of the other, many of the other platforms, um, they might uh, have sub, some um, um, features that are more desirable or maybe it's more usable, but you can't make a copy of Echoes and put it on your own server and be sure that if you just keep an eye out for it, that it will run for the next 20 years. Um, it will run for as long as the owner of the platform will keep it running. And if the owner of the platform decides to change the platform's functionality, then you are just going to be stuck with that. Whereas with a platform like Genios, for uh, using when you use when you choose to use Ojo Vos, uh, if you install it on your own platform on your own server, that will be it. It can run for the next 20 years, for the next 100 years, you know? uh, and it will always be exactly as you set it up yourself or as it was set up at the very start. So it provides much more control. Uh, but this comes at a cost of uh, yeah, responsibility in a way. Um, so yeah, it, that's uh, that's a choice that you have to make. But also because it's open source, you are able to, uh, or at least you have the ability to, even if you are not uh, yourself uh, capable of of extending it as well in a way that uh, might work for you, uh, and in a way that somebody else, um, uh, or if you use somebody else's platform, you will not uh, have access to. Uh, as David indeed says, ownership is very important, yeah, indeed, or rather it can be extremely important. And if you talk about sustainability, uh, then uh, ownership means that you are the person or you are the organization that is responsible for that sustainability and can take that responsibility. Uh, so that's a few uh, cents on that. Um, and Thank then you. indeed David asks uh, a list of other platforms. Um, I think that is a very long list of uh, indeed platforms that allow similar things. Yeah, it's uh, all about, uh, and David shares a link in the chat. Uh, um, uh, these are all platforms that in one way or the other allow you to put things on a map. Yeah, um, I don't think all still exist, but many do similar things and most of them are proprietary. And there's a very small number of them uh, that is uh, much more open or even indeed completely open source. Yeah, Lu Lucy uh, goes on to ask a question about, um, uh, I, I would take that as kind of like legal responsibility. Uh, this is a very, um, this is a bit of a Pandora's box of um, uh, a discussion. Uh, it, de it depends on very, very many uh, 
one of them. Keep it very short. It means basically if you're in the US, then typically you don't take responsibility. That's why there's so much hate on Twitter and Facebook, because both Twitter and Facebook, which in a way you could argue are also platforms like this, um, although they have a very different focus. That's why they can get away with uh, uh, not having to worry too much about uh, a former president who uh, almost tweets only hate speech because they don't have to take the responsibility. Back to Eugenio. Yeah, thank you, Babak. I think that what you point out is really important and it also allows you to to manage not only the platform, but also the data. And as, as we all know, our data, the data that we deliver to Facebook and, and other large social networks is, is then sold to all sorts of corporations or, or agencies we, we don't even know about who's buying our data. And another advantage of owning your own server and running the platform on your own server, this platform or other platform, is that uh, you can guarantee the community that their data will not be sold unless you want to sell it, but uh, you, can not, you can, if you choose, you can guarantee that the data will not be sold. And you can also take the responsibility into your own hands of uh, moderating content and uh, excluding uh, hate speech or other harmful uh, messages. Uh, as I said when I was uh, replying to Mary, at some point, we had this picture of a man who was beaten very badly, and you could consider that as a sort of hate speech that, okay, we hate criminals and whoever steals coconuts will be beaten by us. Uh, but then you can start this process with the community in which the community itself decides whether they want that sort of message to appear on their website or not. So that it's a very different process. and. What I think is that these huge social networks with millions and, and even billions of people is not a model, a sustainable model for the future. I think that social networks should remain small. This is my own point of view and, and you of course can disagree with me. But I think that small social networks of people who have affinities, who have common interests, it to me it looks like more of, uh, of uh, the, the future of the web looks looks a little bit more like that to me. And of course, it's very nice to be able to contact all sorts of people on Facebook or Twitter. But my question is, is it really helping us or is it harming us? And harming us in the sense that we get a lot of hate speech, we get a lot of racist speech, sexist speech, uh, political manipulation, and also, the, the, let's say that the public sphere of discussion gets reduced to a yes or a no, to uh, like or hate. So I think that smaller groups, smaller social networks of people who, who can talk about common things, who can sort of regulate by themselves, that looks more like the future of the web to me. But you can, of course, disagree with me. Um, there's another question by Lucy. Uh, have you always influenced curation through discussion and questioning? Not always, uh, I have to say. In the, the example that I offered you uh, about this, this particular picture of the man who was beaten up, I tried to have a little bit of influence because I knew that that picture would be uh, rather harmful for the community if, if everybody, if somebody from the outside could look at it. But then there were other kinds of contents which probably I did not totally like, uh, but were not harmful. Uh, and the community just simply decided to leave those, those contents there. And I, in those cases, I did not influence the, the curation or tried not to influence it in, in any way. Uh, and yeah, I mean, if there are more comments, please, please just open your microphone. I was just reading from, from the chat, but if you want to, to just speak out, please do. I'll second that, uh, Eugenio. Uh, you don't have to put your questions in the chat. You can just interject. Um, I'm going to say one more thing on uh, small social networks. Uh, one thing that um, 
in somewhat more activist circles, uh, you see now uh, that there's a move towards is um, talk of um, um, what is often called the Federverse, which is short for a federated universe, which is a little bit like uh, specifically in relation to a platform called Mastodon, uh, which is a kind of Twitter clone, uh, which allows anyone uh, quite similar to uh, Genius Ochovos to set up their own instance. Uh, basically a Twitter clone that at the same time allows people to talk on this one instance, but also to communicate with people in other instances. But because the ownership of each individual instance is um, individual or you know, can be a group of people, but it's separate from all the other instances, you can set your own rules on your own instance. So you can say some people, these part, kinds of people can join, or you can say if you join us, then you have to behave in a particular way. Uh, while at the same time, if you choose, you can still tie in to the other networks on uh, a rule set that you can also define yourself. Uh, so the consequence is that there is much more control over content that is shared within much smaller groups of people. Um, and uh, well, this is gaining a lot of ground uh, specifically for their for its flexibility um, uh, and for the control that it uh, delivers to the end users. Yeah. Any more questions? Mary, you can speak up. Huh? You don't have to put it in the chat. More view, but I'm I'm always so uh, dismayed by that. Um, and you know, you kind of, but it doesn't mean we should stop trying. <laughs> but you know, we should stop yeah. trying to create the ideal. Um, I I think we just have to be realistic, and maybe if there's a way to to build in. Uh, digitally, maybe there is a way to build in uh, things, you know, systems that mitigates against that, but I, I don't think there is. Yeah, but yeah, I think I think the problem is most of us, including myself, we we're busy, we're doing stuff, we're 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 jogging along, and we're we're trying to do the best we can, but. I know that I often ignore and don't protest and don't do enough against other things that really aren't for the common good. And it's laziness, I think a mixture of laziness, cowardness and fatigue. And I think probably that's the majority of us. Um, but I, I, yeah, I don't know. Sorry, that's a bit, dis that's a bit despondent, but yeah. <laughs> but we'll keep, we'll keep trying, we'll keep trying. <laughs> exactly, and, and I think we should not feel guilty about it. I mean, we're all in a way trapped by, by these platforms. They, they, they sort of expanded uh, in such a way into our daily lives that left us without other options. So the way in which I see these technological platforms is that I think it's worth to try, as you say, we, we keep trying. But if we see some signals that sort of let us know that, okay, this worked for a while, but um, I cannot continue using the same platform, so I just need to move on. Probably we, we will never arrive at a platform that will work forever and ever. We, we just have to keep moving on, I think, and finding our own little spot within this world, which is becoming more and more oriented towards the market, towards the kind of politics that we don't like. So, but it's, it, we, I, we definitely need to keep trying, but also to keep moving as soon as we see some signs that, yeah, probably it's better to move on and find something else. So, and if there's a community that really wants to use these platforms and is really interested in using them, they can also move on. It's a, it's a common decision. For example, this group, uh, if we some, if for some reason find that the platform we're not using is uh, perhaps 
dealing with uh, some obscure issues that we don't agree with, then we move on to a different platform, and then we move on to a, another one, and we just have to keep moving as, as nomads, maybe. Yeah, but uh, in, in addition to that, uh, and also very much in response to Mary, but also Eugenio, what you were saying earlier, uh, indeed, it, it's unlikely that there is going to be one platform that will um, provide in the needs for every single individual, uh, because you, you can only use a kind of largest common denominator. But it is much more likely that if there are many platforms, that there will be several platforms that are very close to the individual needs of every single person. Uh, so in, in that sense, actually, it makes a lot of sense to split up or to, to instead of using one large network to use many small networks with different rules and regulations, with different objectives, with different uh, ideas, um, because then the chance is much bigger that there will be a platform that is ideal for any single person. Plus, if the networks are smaller, it is also more likely that the individuals in these networks can curate or are willing and able um, to curate the content of these networks together so that they are better reflections of the participants. Um, so yeah, yeah, Mary, I also am a cynic in, uh, at the same time. Uh, so I'm also not so sure whether this will ever, ever happen. But indeed, if we don't try, uh, or at least some of us, and try to move towards an, um, uh, a context where the individual uh, has more uh, freedom and is also at the same time more comfortable, then you know, if we don't do it, no one does it, right? Because if we look towards uh, the, the Facebooks and the Twitters of the, and the Googles of this work, world, then the only thing that we can expect is uh, financial exploitation because we are simply part of their profit motive. Um, but that's just them, and we don't have to accept this. We can really make this decision ourselves, and there are more and more tools available that allow us to do this. Yeah, Ojo Vos, you can install on your own server, and if you stop liking Eugenio, you can still use his software. Uh, but of course, you, you look at this guy, he's great. You cannot stop liking him. Um, but uh, maybe uh, the guy who uh, founded Mastodon uh, will turn out to be um, a less uh, interesting or less pleasant individual, but it doesn't matter because his software you can run on your own server. You can do with it as you like, uh, but you cannot influence Zuckerberg because he only wants your money. I just put uh, another link uh, in the chat. Uh, it's another software platform, another example. It's probably uh, included in, in the link uh, sent by, by Simon, I think. He sent a, a link of, of platforms available at the Walk, Listen, Create website. And this one called Ushahiri, I, I particularly like it because it was developed in Kenya. So uh, that, that's also an example of, Baba, of what Babak is saying, that we can develop new platforms uh, that are directed for a different usage other than financial exploitation or whatever obscure means. And Ushahiri, I, I like it a lot, not only because it comes from Kenya, and we normally don't think that technological develop, developments can come from Africa, but they do, and Ushahiri is one of them. And I have to say, this, this platform has been used, for example, to monitor elections, even in the United States and even here in Mexico. So it has been used by a group of people, activists who are using Ushahidi, just, uh, uh, just to let you know, is, is quite similar to Ojobos, but it does some extra things like allow you to send SMS messages or, or using other means of communication and basically is mapping stories. And there is a very nice story about Ushahidi in which a group of people living in a slum in Nairobi called uh, Kibera uh, used Ushahidi to actually put the slum on the map. And it was important for them because this slum was going to be destroyed and of course new shiny buildings were going to be built and mo shopping malls and w all sorts of things that, that uh, urban uh, speculators like to do, but the people from this slum, from Kibera, they used Ushahidi to, to map the slum, because if you looked at the map of Nairobi, 
the place where the slum was appeared as an empty space, but the, these people actually put the, uh, their living neighborhood on the map using, using this software. So that's also an example. There are many, many such initiatives going on outside Facebook, Twitter, and all the usual uh, networks that, that we all use. I, I use Twitter myself also. But as Babak says, we, we, we can develop new things, and there is a huge potential. I'm also a big believer of the potential of these tools to actually help smaller communities to, to make their voices heard. Yeah. Just to leave on a, a more positive note. That's so brilliant, because um, it's only through Babak's network that I obviously found this out, you know, and it's, um, I think the more we can spread the kind of knowledge of the how to become independent from the, the big networks and to, to create this, uh, you know, smaller independent kind of the things that you've been talking about, basically. Um, that's a way of kind of breaking all of that up and giving people people uh, some kind of independence and that there are always things that will go wrong. But this is it, it's, it's brilliant, but it's certainly not within the common domain in terms of knowledge, you know, in my bit of Western kind of, you know, very sort of limited kind of digital and internet knowledge, but I'm sure that goes for a lot of people. So, yeah, I think we need to kind of get that information out there. And it's interesting, I don't know if that's been on the kind of mainstream media, the information about this type of um, sharing of kind of ideas and knowledge, you know, of independent platforms. But that's, yeah, that's kind of just a, a, a thought. We have been speaking about digital tools for, for mapping and, and for creating community memories. But even, even as a software developer, I, I am very much in favor of using other means. And I just wanted to share with you here in the chat a link to a group of people in Argentina called Iconoclasistas who do very similar projects. They work with communities, with specific issues that are important for the communities, and they build maps with, together with the community using paper, stickers, pens, and that's perfectly fine. That's fantastic. I really love their work, and that's why I recommend it. Because one thing that is really important for me as a software developer is to not get stuck in software. Let's not... Uh, turn software into an obstacle, because we all, every, all the time, even myself, I find, okay, I'm, I probably don't have enough knowledge to, to install this or, or to use this, and it's very hard for me to keep up with all the new things that are coming out and the updates and whatever. And sometimes when we re what we really want to do is create a community memory together with a community. Then if the software becomes an obstacle, then just forget about the software and go to paper, pens, whatever means are useful and available. And probably that sort of contradicts my, my whole presentation today, but I don't think it's a contradiction. And I just showed you a book, a paper book, and I think we, we shouldn't get married to, to a specific medium, like I, I just use software or I just use paper. Whatever is useful, whatever is available, whatever allows us, the, the important thing is, is, is the, the process itself that, that, you, that you carry out together with the community. The stories, the way in which the stories are shared. And it, we have invented so many media throughout history that software is just the latest. And yes, it's very exciting and it expands the possibilities. But using paper is absolutely fine, and I'm all for it. I'd say that that is maybe a, a very good thought to uh, to slowly wrap up this discussion with. Um, um, I'll I'll um, 
make it a bit more extreme, forget software, use pen and paper, right? Although uh, if we would have done that, then this discussion would have take would have been like a um, a chess match match by email by a uh, snail mail um, between uh, well we had eighteen people at some point so that would have been a, a very uh, slow but more thoughtful maybe discussion but it would have taken months perhaps um, uh, case in point for example I've been trying to. Uh, uh, send the prizes to the winners of Soundwalk September from uh, from Brazil, and um, I, I had to take the prizes to the United States because in Brazil they kept on sending them back to me. <laughs> so the, the mail would not accept uh, the packages. Um, so uh, that might be a good uh, thought to end on. Thank you. Well, unless there are um, oh, there is there is at least one that is useful for uh, the participants. Uh, was, who was it? Who was it? Who was it? Kirsty specifically uh, asked um, how to get in touch with you. Um, so maybe if you feel like it, you can put something in the chat, be it your Twitter account or email or, or website, whatever is most sure. comfortable to you. Uh, um, Twitter, uh, yeah, I'll just write it down here in the chat. My Twitter handle, if that's easier for you or my email. Uh, rather long, but here it is. And I'll be very happy if you get in touch with me uh, for whatever you, you want to talk. Uh, I'll be more than happy to, to talk to you via email, Twitter, or snail mail. <laughs> <laughs> but for that, we need a physical address. Yeah, I don't have a permanent yeah, one, but Twitter for that matter. I, yeah. I don't have a permanent one, but uh, yeah, with some luck, you can you can find me somewhere. Yeah. Much. Uh, I did see David also around um, uh, solutions for. Suggest David to throw it somewhere on uh, our platform. Uh, there are several places where you can talk about that, including in the forum, uh, but also, for example, with the thread that you shared yourself, where we compare a bunch of these uh, tools, including a whole thinking of something more structural. We are very open to this, but there are also many places online where people talk about solutions in relation to. Uh, um, map based storytelling or, or um, uh, sharing of experience of uh, yeah, thanks everyone for sticking around for just under two hours um, we've got uh, so we, I hope to see, we hope to see you again all of you soon thank you very much and see you very soon thank you all very much uh, thanks it was lovely Jill. talking to you and then yeah Looking forward to, to talking to you again. Goodbye.